Listen to radio number one. Your world weekend is more fun. Nothing in this world, my friend, can be a world weekend. It's wonderful WIRL. WTVP Peoria, also broadcasting in digital and high definition format. Welcome to At Issue. Thank you for joining us. I'm H. Wayne Wilson, and for the next half hour, we're going to um, have some fun and also talk about whatever happened to radio stations. Specifically, the early part of this program, we're going to be talking about rock and roll on AM radio in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And if you recall those times, if you grew up at the time I grew up, you had uh, a little six transistor radio. This was high technology, friends. And you used to take the uh, earpiece out, used to plug it in, put this under the pillow so your mom and dad didn't find out about it, and stick it in your ear so you could hear things like this. This is WPEO 10 to 0. And that's what gets us started is the WPEO was the first real powerhouse in radio. And to discuss this, we have a couple of uh, former disc jockeys, and we also have a radio historian. Let me introduce first Lee Malcolm. And Lee was on uh, WIRL from about 75 to 80? Approximately, yeah. Okay, welcome. Thank you. And uh, Larry Ware is here. Larry has mm -hmm. spent I don't know how many, not hours, weeks and months researching radio in Peoria. Larry, thank you for being here. You're welcome. And we also have a familiar face, Lee Ranson. Before his television days, Lee's, Lee was a radio person, um, approximately 60 to 64, 65 yes. on, um, on uh, WIRL and then to WXCL after that. That's right. I was at IRL back in the early 60s when it was, uh, it was a fun time in radio back then. Obviously, things have changed a lot, and that's why we're here to talk about it. The jingle we heard was WPEO from about 1958. Can you talk, tell me a little bit about jingles back then, Larry? Well, um, let me just go back and say that WR, WPEO came on the air in 46 as WMMJ. Um, the jingle packages were part of the top 40 format, uh, kind of set the tone, and um, that particular jingle was produced by PAMS, and that was a group out of uh, Dallas, Texas. And uh, we have a jingle that we're going to be hearing shortly that came from where? Uh, that, that's also a PAMS. This is a 1960 uh, jingle that's coming up, uh, the get up and go and blast off. It has kind of a, uh, the space race was big in 1960, of course, with the Soviet Union and so forth. So uh, it has kind of that theme to it. Get up and go, 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 everybody with brilliant radio, hey, hey. Get up and go, 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 we're with you all the way. WPEO 1020. Four, three, two, one. It's blast off time on Radiant Radio. We're going into orbit. WPEO 1020. And there it goes. <laughs> I, I almost feel like Telstar no and Sputnik. And, um, uh, tell me a little bit about what made PEO a powerhouse. Well, the main thing, in 1957, they were, per they were uh, purchased by Dandy Broadcasting Corporation of Kansas City. And um, they had the hottest top 40 music at that time, the very progressive. They had contests and, of course, the jingles. Uh, they had a gentleman on by the name of Harry Harrison. He worked there from 55 to 59. He was a program director. And he also contributed to the number one position by picking the most popular music. WIRL was playing very conservative music at the time. Uh, Harry Harrison was uh, also known as the morning mayor. He had a morning shift, and he became a legendary radio personality in the New York market. And this is what he sounded like. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, the happy new one by Dean Martin. A familiar melody, huh? Now it's called I Ain't Gonna Leave This Life No More. And how do you do to you? Harrison's back again, the morning mayor, with a lot of music for you on Radio 1 in Peoria, Illinois, WPEO. And our Radio 1 time, three minutes past 8 o'clock. Yeah, one thing that I noticed in listening to the old air checks at radio stations is WPEO used the tone at any time. It any wasn't time. At the top of there the hour. There was no oh, standard. Yeah. <laughs> Elements were thrown in at random. All you the did, time. you did. It was the official time, no matter if it was 1 o'clock, <laughs> 1 after, or whatever. Um, can, you, can you talk about, the, the, back then, stations did music surveys. Can you tell me a little bit about that, Larry? Well, they had the weekly survey. It looked something like this. Uh, WPEO in 1957, for instance, had uh, number one song was Lot of Lovin' by Gene Vincent. Um, and they were, they were called a top 20 station just because of their frequency, 1020 AM. You're tuned to Radio 1 in Peoria, WPEO. And a good, good morning to you on Monday, October 19th, 1959. Bob Moore here on the Early Bird Show from WPEO. And off we go this morning with Roy Hamilton. Oh, the voice of Roy Hamilton there this morning on the Early Bird Show to start things off. A great romance. Radio One time now. 23 minutes before 6 in the morning. At 6, Dick Herman, the farm show. At 6.30, Harry Harrison, the morning mayor. I told you they use the tone at any time of the hour. <laughs> tone uh, to wake you up, won't it? Yeah. <laughs> no, that was Bob Moore. Yes. And you notice he introduced Harry Harrison coming up at 6.30. Bob Moore was the news director for WPEO from 1958 to 1960. He would fill in until Harry got there at 6.30 in the morning, and he would put on the play records and, and so forth. Uh, Bob Moore uh, went on to station like KSTT in Davenport, worked in news most of his life, and then recently retired from the Federal Reserve. Um, th at the time, the late 50s and maybe 1960, WPEO was on top. Uh, then all of a sudden, WIRL took over in the ratings. What happened to WPEO? Well, WPEO, of course, was a daytime operating station. Uh, they had to, they were not a clear channel. Uh, they were on a clear channel, rather. And um, they got bought out in 1959 by Radio One. They did not maintain uh, the same momentum that they had. WIRL began playing the top 40 hits. They were also a nighttime station, and they edged them out. The Big Sound on WIRL. And that was the sound of WIRL early, early on. And we talked a little bit about jingle packages before. Where did these come from? Well, these came, apparently, Lee, you had a... Yeah, I think this that. probably came from Pepper Tanner in, uh, in Memphis. The, they had the first set of jingles with the big red and the little red, and they had all the little singing jingles. And some of the jingles were like 45 seconds long, so we didn't bring them in today because it would take too long on the program. But uh, they did so many promotions. Uh, number one, of course, 24 hours a day was just a huge thing. Uh, they had Stan Major, who was their nighttime announcer, that did a seven-day marathon where he was on the air for seven straight days, 24 hours a day, from the Bud Rollett Chrysler uh, Plymouth uh, store up on Franklin Street. Uh, they, they did things like that that just created such a stir in the area that WPO just kind of disappeared. Mm. And, and you mentioned that the promos were longer back then. Or, uh, the, yeah. So, and uh, they sounded something like this. Prospect Street or even on Galena Road. <laughs> Wonderful worlds in the know. Wonderful worlds in the know. Always something happening on Wonderful WIRL. That's a toe tapper. You just don't. It is, yeah, it's it? a toe tapper, isn't it? You just don't hear uh, the no. jingles. We we can't even call them jingles, really. They were too long to be jingles. Well, and the, most of them, of course, had a little stories with them, like this mentioned Prospect Road and Galena. So, so you localize, and you did mm -hmm. everything for the community. We had Big Red and Little Red, which were the news units that went out and did live interviews with the park director, the Halloween event, whatever it might be. There was so many things that connected the people to the immediate Peoria area. 
That jingle was from 1960, and that happens to be the year that you started yes. at WIRL. And uh, you, you, your show, at least at, at one point, was called The Go Show, and right. also your name was Leapin' Lee. They gave, they gave me the name Leapin' Lee because I was uh, a very uh, ecstatic, excited, enthusiastic young man <laughs> at the time. And uh, I think if the people will remember back then, they probably don't even recognize my voice, but I think they might get a kick out of it. Well, then let's listen to Lee Ranson. Hey, baby, <laughs> it's time to go on the Lee Ranson Go Show. You got it, baby. Everything goes on the Go Show tonight. The finale for a leaper as we got to sound of 40. You're running down the top 40. This is Roger Miller. Little do whack a do just for you. Raining like mad out there on a frantic Friday. We go to number 38. This is another newcomer to the survey sheet. Chad Stewart and Jeremy Clyde. It's called a Willow Weep for Me. That's hard to believe. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you mean by enthusiastic. Um, oh yeah. And and uh, there was there was a something about a jock's delivery. Yeah. You know, Chad and Jeremy Willow, we Willow. Form. <laughs> you, you didn't just talk like a normal person. You had to give that little extra bit. And I think when Lee Malcolm comes on, he'll give you that too. But it, it's just the DJs had that extra little push for him. This this is actually the, the last year of my show. They actually had me doing something a little different. The first three or four years I was there, I was pretty much a normal person. I talked like a normal normal person. But then Dick Biondi started to come into our market a little bit stronger. And Dick was the wild I and they called him from WLS in Chicago and they wanted me to kind of emulate him and that's why I started to really punch it and then at the end I said this is my final show back in the end of 64 uh, I decided the yelling was just a little too much for me I was gonna let the 15 year olds do it and I, I as a 23 year old got out <laughs> and it switched over to the country music station 23 years old <laughs> yeah uh, who were some of the other personalities on IRL at the time oh we had Chris Robin Weaver was the immortal morning man he was great Ron Thorne did the uh, 9 to noon show uh, we had uh, Jack Wiley, uh, Mike Rollins. We had so many great announcers over the years. Jack Edsel, and one of my favorites, one of my one of my good friends, VLJ. I think we have something from VLJ. Good guy song number five this week. That's the one by the Grassroots. The song called "Midnight yeah, Confession." VLJ. Good morning, everybody. Good guy VLJ with you on a Saturday morning, the 19th of October. <laughs> Is that great? VLJ. Saturday morning. And, Saturday morning. And, and, and yeah. you heard the little son of ox. The yeah. little knife. Yeah. <laughs> VLJ. Yes. Uh, now, VLJ, where did that, I mean, that's just initials. What it's was initials. It? In fact, it's his, his real initials, believe it or not. And with his name, you'll understand why he used VLJ. Volney Lamb Jr. Oh, that's a mouthful. Yeah. Volney? Volney was his first name. And is his first name. And it was his dad's first name, who I met many times, too. So. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let's, let's move forward. We'll, we're going to leave the 60s. But WIRL stayed on top, for the most part, in, into the 70s. And that's when you came to WIRL. Can you describe, was, was, were things different than from the 60s? or? Oh, I don't know. It was a lot of fun. I can say that there was camaraderie, which I believe yes. you guys enjoyed back in the in the real early days. Yeah. Uh, everybody got along. We had a full staff. I think we ran six six jocks running four hour shifts, something like that, and uh, anchored, of course, by Robin Weaver in the morning uh, for many years. I think he was on for twenty five years, um, and uh, he he was always pulling pranks on and off of the air. Uh, and it was just a blast to work around Weaver and everybody else at the radio station. And it was a huge facility up on Grossenbach Road. Uh, there were two radio stations in there at the time and just a building full of people. Well, let's find out what Lee Malcolm sounded like back in 1976. Oh, let's not. <laughs> Your kind of music anytime you want it on WIR. Brothers Johnson working on your soul, mama. Right on, right on, right on. Brothers Johnson looking out for number one. That's the name of the album. I'll be good to you, baby, at WIRL. Lee Malcolm at 749. Can it's, you say rapid oh, fire? Oh, oh. It's painful. To Isn't it? <laughs> we had to drink a lot of coffee. A lot of salt. <laughs> and when you got through with a five hour air shift, you knew you had yeah. you, you, you hadn't really made a valuable contribution to society, but you knew you had done some work. And what was uh, challenging for us in those days, down the hall uh, was 
what was then called Sweet, Sweet 107, WSWT. And it was automated, played beautiful music, and the disc jockeys on WIRL frequently on weekends and at night would complete their air shift, five hours of screaming and carrying on, and then we would have to walk down the hall and record a series of two-minute uh, newscasts. In a on, very oh, quiet on, tone. On, <laughs> on W Suite, all music all the time. Yes. And it was a difficult transition because you were going from, from one environment to another one uh, instantly. Mm. Yeah. And uh, Both of you mentioned uh, Robin Weaver. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about what kind of personality and how he was on the air? Uh, he was he was an unusual, one-of-a-kind type of guy. I mean, he did everything off the cuff. Very rarely did he write anything down. He didn't prepare his bits. He came in at quarter to five in the morning, was on the air at five o'clock, and it was just rapid fire with his his funny comments. He could create anything instantly yeah. on just about any uh, topic, uh, and he would pull stunts off the air just as he did on the air. A yeah. lot of them we can't we talk can't about. mention them on television. Uh, but he would do little things like put. <laughs> Uh, signs up and down the hallway that said dry paint. Uh, <laughs> yeah. when, the, when the corporate uh, executives came from Kankakee, which was at that time the headquarters of the company, uh, he would put a tie on, which amounted to a twist tie from a loaf of bread. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> there was uh, some china, a set of china, uh, out in the, in the dining area at the radio station, never used to my knowledge. But one day, Weaver, early in the morning before anybody showed up, uh, at the radio station, he went out and he put all these place settings out and did a beautiful job decorating the table. And uh, no reason. No reason whatsoever. <laughs> he didn't just, need a reason. Just, no, he just oh did it. Well, and he, uh, one, one other thing that he would do that uh, frequently he would go out in the woods. We were surrounded by a wooded area. He would collect walnuts. And in those days, we all used big IBM Selectric typewriters. And he'd load the walnuts load the inside. Load the walnuts the, in the typewriter, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> so if the well, typewriter didn't work, he knew Robin was nearby. <laughs> well, <laughs> if, if the year was 1976. There was a drought in central Illinois, and Robin Weaver decided that he was able to correct the drought, and this is how he sounded when he did that. The uh, WIRO rain-making machine, it's a, uh, oh, uh, like I can best describe it, uh, a chemical reactivator mechanism designed to reverse the molecular compounds within the atmosphere at all levels, which will create a monsoonic mixture of moisturized ozonic ampedes, and it'll ozonize hemoskeletic oxidized acids. And this creates uh, an area of forced preset within the power zone of the WIRL Moisture Monster. We aim our dual copic beam at an angle of 137 and a quarter Celsius horizontally, and that sprays an area of 250 to 408 microbar miles, which in time will change the cloud formations from hemodehydration to one of aquasation, thus creating forced precipitation within the treated area. It all makes perfect sense. Didn't know he was a meteorologist, did you? Yeah. Yeah. And, and now that you do weather, did, yes. was it making any sense? None at all. <laughs> I was going to say, Lee, is that the, is that the format that None you use? For, uh, I, I, I wish I'd thought of that, actually. <laughs> oh, that's well, amazing. Let me make a transition here in, uh, with, with Robin's comments. He, he was a personality. You were a personality. You mm. were a personality. Didn't, uh, uh, you, and you were on an evenings. Yes. Evening radio and you were a personality. Whatever happened to that in radio? And not necessarily just AM radio. When FM took over, there were jocks that had personalities. And all of a sudden... A lot, a lot of things have happened. Uh, I think mainly the bottom line in radio stations probably happened more than anything else. Uh, they, they had 35 employees back in the 60s. They have five or six now for each station. Um, live radio is just not around anymore. There are a few stations, luckily, we're, we're lucky here in Peoria, we do have a few stations that do some live radio. But as far as air personalities, uh, it's, it's, a whole new, it's a whole new bag. And speaking primarily to, to the top 40 format, which is what we called it back then, uh, which is hard to define because you would hear whatever was popular. It could be right. Donnie and Marie Eisman, Led Followed Zeppelin, Johnny Paul Cash. Yeah. I mean, you know, you had them all, yeah. And uh, the, the format by design was full of the things that we've been talking about jingles, uh, bells, buzzers. Yeah. Uh, the jocks generally tried to convey the personality in short bites because we were talking between every song. So you had 10, 12, 15 seconds. Of course, in the morning, the guys would spend more time talking. But I think that the, the industry began to research itself very heavily, conducting behavioral, attitudinal, perceptual studies and things like that, that came up with suggestions uh, to ownership and, and management to fix the radio stations, which in many cases weren't broken to begin with. Right. So they began to find that listeners that were surveyed didn't like screaming jocks, 
They didn't like jocks talking on top of the music. They didn't like the jingles. So the research said these are all negatives. Let's we got to get these negatives out of the format. And you pull those away. Pull all the negatives. <laughs> you don't have any positives left because right. top 40 was a very foreground approach. I mean, if you listen for hours on end, you you know it would wear you down. That's right. Uh, so I think the result of that. Uh, and that's not the only thing that contributed, but it was a large factor. The result of that was a sterile, bland background. Life almost approach. jukebox like lifeless, effect. Lifeless radio. Yeah, it really has been. And, and, and it's still that way, basically, except they are at least doing tracks now, although you can do a show, what, a five hour show? And Through modern technology, a, hour, a show minutes. can be done in a very short period of time. Whereas uh, we used through, to sit there. Through a method called voice tracking. Yeah, we used to sit there and, and have requests. People would call, they could actually talk to you. You were right there. And in fact, one of my big uh, shows, the, I had a, the Lee Ranson's Request Nest. And it used to be one full hour of requests. I would record on the little tapes, and the people would call in and they'd say, oh, Hi, this is John Jones, and I'm from Peoria Central High School. I'd like to hear You're the Reason I'm Living. And we would play it, and they, we'd play their open and the record right there, and that whole hour would be would be them introducing the song. And well, you were working because you were queuing up the we tape and up the tape. timing the, the bits and all of that. But everything's pre-programmed in terms of music. Most of it is. Now it is. It, yeah, it was, uh, even the, during the days I was at uh, IRL, uh, our playlists were, were pretty tight. The, the jocks had some latitude, but not much. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was, this was to ensure that the proper songs got played, you know, a certain number of times per day. And uh, I don't know if you had We didn't uh, freedom. have that. We had, the, we had the top 40 list, of course. And we had, but we could play basically anything. And, of course, we did play a lot of local records. Whenever someone came out with a local record, that was always on the air. And then, of course, back in the 80s and it started to change, no local records ever got played on the air around here, or at least very rarely anyway. So people like Ron Voles and the Rock and yeah. R's or oh. Wild Child Gibson or somebody like that was played. Always played. Today, that no. wouldn't be possible. No. Maybe no. some stations might feature local talent in, in maybe a weekend block or something like that, but it's rare and nothing right. like what Lee described, where that, uh, the inclusion of the, that material contributed to the local sound of the radio station. And that's what, uh, that also made it to the top 40, because we checked with Jay's Music and Hi-Fi One Stop and Peoria Music Mart, the local record sellers, every week to see what their top 10 was or top 20 was. So that contributed to our top 40. Wow. So we had Wild Child Gibson's Uncle John on our top 40 at WIRL Radio. It wasn't nationally, but it was our local. So we moved it into the top 40. You, you just don't see that. And though. there were a lot of great Chicago groups uh, oh. that did well through exposure on WLS and WCFL. Uh, the Buckinghams, good buddies right. of mine, the New Colony Six, the Crying Shames. Right. All these guys had that distinct Chicago sound. And were it not for the uh, assistance of the radio stations in Chicago, they may not have they made it on the national it. scene, but a lot of them did. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, Back back in the 60s and the 70s, we used to, and I, by the way, for everyone's benefit, I worked at WMBD Radio and WCBU Radio uh, back then, but broadcasters pretty much ran broadcast stations and owned them. They owned them, right, right. Now you have big corporations owning them. Uh, corporations can now own... I don't know how many stations you can own in the market now, but I think it's probably five or six. Yeah, there's anyway. a screwy formula that nobody's ever been able to explain that, that I can understand. But it used to be that you could own one AM and one FM. And then after deregulation in, I think, 96, uh, it changed those rules. So that allowed the big guys to eat the little guys, so right. to speak. Right. And you had consolidation, uh, you had downsizing, all these things that we see happening not only in radio, but in other In industries. other businesses, yeah. too. And, and when I was at WXCL Radio, we were owned by uh, three gentlemen, the uh, station manager, the uh, chief engineer, and the uh, head accounting person. That was it. The three fellows owned the station. If you wanted something done, you went to the, you, you went to the front office and said, we'd like to do a promotion, do it tomorrow. Well, speaking of promotions, let's go back in time. And Lee Ranson, you're in this promo from, <laughs> I, I believe this is the 1960s. 19, yeah. It's your chance to name the two leopard cubs of the Glen Oak Zoo. One is male, the other female, and they both need names. See the two leopard cubs. The winner will win a wonderful clock transistor radio from WIRL. Send your card in now. All entries must be postmarked by midnight this Friday. And listen to this. Lee Ranson will announce the winner this Saturday at 3 p.m., but he'll do it from the lion's cage at Glen Oak Zoo. And there will be three lions in that cage with him. Hey, this is Ranson. Let me out of here. <laughs>
<laughs> Everything was bigger than life. Theater of the mind. It, it was, was. It was. It Ken was Brown a, was a ton of fun, as we used to say. Well, Ken Brown was one of the voices on that, by the way, and he was production director galore. He just did such a great job on commercials. What year was that, Lee? That was 1961. Six Lee, I've got to ask you, how did you get out of the lion cage? I got out of there, believe it or not, the three lions they had over in the other side of the cage. It was a two-cage thing. Oh, I was on one side of the cage, the three lions were on the other. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me ask uh, Lee Malcolm and, and Lee Ranson what you're doing today. Lee Malcolm? I operate my own studio. I primarily do uh, voiceover and uh, commercial production. Uh, a few local uh, clients, most of my clients are in other markets, but uh, I contract with a couple of radio stations here and uh, one of the large uh, auto dealerships uh, through an agency. And uh, I have a website if anybody wants to check it out. It's uh, LeeMalcolm.com. Uh, the last L, don't lose it. L-E-E-M-A-L-C-O-L-M.com. Mm -hmm. Or if you put in LeeRanson.com. That's right. Well, well that's that link to me. Up there too. Yeah, that's <laughs> Lee Ranson, I, I, I don't know that I need to ask this, but what are you doing today? I have been doing weather for about 35 years. You know, it's really funny how that I got into that because of, of Ralph Smith, who was the news director over at WIRL Radio. He became news director at Channel 19. One day, Roly Keith got sick. Their weekend person was out of town. And at 3 in the afternoon, on a Friday afternoon, Ralph calls me over at WXEL radio and he says I have got a problem I don't have anybody to do my weather and you're the only one I know that can bull your way through this program and probably do okay that was in 72 and I've been doing weather ever since well with that I want to say thank you to Lee Malcolm to radio historian Larry Ware and to Lee Ranson and we're going to leave you with a, um, a Robin Weaver commercial this is from uh, Sandy's which had four outlets back in the 1950s and 60s in Peoria they were the big the big the big, in fact, they outsold McDonald's about 10 to 1 in this market back in the 50s and early 60s. So as we say goodbye, we're going to uh, have a show in two weeks talking about avian flu. But until then, listen to Robin Weaver in the middle of this. Look for the wee Scottish lass on the sign and then drive right into Sandy's. You'll eat your fill and be satisfied you will. The food's so delicious at Sandy's. Remember, pure beef hamburger, just 15 cents. You like the thrift and the service that is swift, so drive in your car straight to Sandy's. Now during Lent, you can still enjoy the delicious food at your four Sandy's drive-in. Sandy's, famous for pure ground beef hamburgers for just 15 cents, also offers you delicious fish and toasted cheese sandwiches. Buy a fresh fish sandwich for just 25 cents at Sandy's, made with delicious haddock, caught fresh in the ice-cold waters of Norway and just 25 cents at Sandy's. And remember those melt-in-your-mouth toasted cheese sandwiches for just 15 cents at Sandy's. Anytime is the right time for Sandy's on Sheridan across from Sheridan Village on Western just below the hill on McClure between Knoxville and North and on Court Street in Pekin. So drive in your car straight to Sand. More to come tonight from Morton and your hometown. Still ahead, the search for the average American. And next, how do you say down boy when you're looking up? We had a nice day out there today. Officially, we have not had a freezing temperature yet. That's officially at the uh, airport anyway. A couple of areas did this morning. And all of us should tomorrow morning, as we're supposed to get down to about 30. So we should have some frost out there. Take a look at that weekend forecast ahead. You're watching your home team at 10. Tom McIntyre, Mike Deming, Lee Ranson's Weather First Forecast, and Sports with Lee Hall. This is News 25 Nightside.